all for joining us today and especially to Shelley and Raj. Um, really it's such a treat to have such a s esteemed governance experts to join us on this very vital topic. Um, we, Shelley and Raj uh, spoke with me beforehand and said they would love interaction from each of you today so we can make this very dynamic. We're not going to just talk and then have Q&A so be, you, you know you're welcome to just shout out any questions you have and uh, certainly they're very experienced at, at uh, being able to address questions real time live. So um, without further ado, uh, given both of you sit on, on such ho high profile boards and have such governance expertise, maybe you could give us some sense of the evolution of boards and governance over the last decade or so. Ready to go first? <clears throat> well, glad to be here. and. Uh, in this August company of Shelley, and if you thought there's no diversity on the board, you can see at least yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We might uh, have everything covered. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. uh, but you know, over time, I've been very fortunate over the last 15 years to have served on seven public company board, including being chairman CEO of Roman Haas and the current board list, five private company boards, part, partly uh, portfolio companies, and they range, frankly, between five million of revenue to $125 billion from 40 employees to 350,000 employees. But one thing I would say that irrespective of the size, some of the issues and challenges that the boards have are not that different. And, and I think that's, that's important to keep in mind, although the level of an engagement is very different depending on the size of the company or how, or what the business mix is. Uh, uh, but, but generally I would say the issues are very similar. So you know, maybe I talk a little differently. What have been my fabulous board mm. experiences? Great. And then, uh, not about specific company, but some areas where I think we, what has changed, mm -hmm. and then more about where we can improve. Maybe that 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 will be helpful. So I, I would say you know where I've seen what I call seamless CEO transition. It's a treat to watch, and all the rest you read in the press. <laughs> <laughs> Highly disciplined approach to what you call capital allocation. Because you know, at the end of the day, boards only do two or three things, and if they do them well, they're rewarded. One is the CEO, succession, and talent, and the second one is how do they use shareholder money over time. Because if they do those things right, I think likelihood is that the end result is going to be great for the shareholders. Part of it is you know, also facing reality at all times and not living in a dream world, but dealing with the reality. But I think the core of this for me has been what I call, Shelley, at least from my view, the trust, transparency, and the candor. And that applies between the CEO and the board, and the board and the management, and frankly, for all stakeholders. That is, at the end of the day, foundation of, of, of really building a great board uh, experience. How have board changed? I will tell you, I have seen board evolve in the last 20 years since I first went to Roman Haas board meeting, but in the last 10 years it's been a phenomenal change. First of all, boards are more diverse, probably not where they should be, but they are very independent. And I say this with a great conviction, anybody who thinks that CEOs control the board or manage the board or they can put their friends and buddies on the board, these days are gone forever boards really are highly independent. They're much more visible. I mean, you would have never heard about board members being named in the Wall Street Journal or CNBC. But these days, if you're in a high profile situation of any size company for that matter, your name is in there. Your reputation is in there. That's changed. Certainly requires a hell of a lot more time than it required 10 years ago. And especially if you're on the compensation or audit committee of the boards. Uh, the no amount of time that you have to spend. I'd say, you know, you have to dive into topics much more deeply. The kind of things you get involved with the strategy of the company, the risk profile of the company, the compliance culture in the company, all of those things. There's much more engagement of the board than in the past. And also the evolution of the board. What skills are needed in the board? And we'll talk more about that in our Q&A session. 
But those are some of the things that I find that you know good boards have and how the role of boards have changed and evolved over time. Terrific, thank you. Shelley, your thoughts? Great, I just, uh, uh, I actually um, was at an event Monday night and that I just thought I'd, I'd share a little bit because I, I, I found myself thinking about sort of yeah. the evolution of boards. And so on Monday night, we, uh, there was a GE dinner to bid fond farewell, uh, and there were literally tears, uh, to three board members, uh, A.G. Laffley, mm -hmm. Senator Sam Nunn, uh, and Roger Penske. And one of the things that, a number of things struck me, you know, you sit there and you sort of have, uh, I think Roger has served on the GE board for 19 years. So, you know, and then there was 17 and 15. And, uh, and so you're saying farewell to uh, uh, these remarkable men. And, but what struck me more than anything was the, the, the feeling among the people in the room. I mean, this was a family dinner. Th this was not sort of a formal business dinner. Uh, spouses were there. We know each other's spouses. We've lived through so much together. We've, we've had fun together, and we've lived through crises together. And one of the things that struck me was we talk so much about the individuals who should be on a board, and, and you, you need outstanding individuals. But it's the dynamic of the board. It's the way the people work together as a board. And we, we had some really challenging times at GE in, in 2008. You know, twice a day board phone calls and all that. And there was not one moment that I ever felt during that difficult time um, that the board wasn't together, that it wasn't respectful. That, uh, of each other's and each other's thoughts, that there was not full, full and total support of the management, uh, that the board continued to articulate so that the management going through this crisis felt every minute that the board was behind them and, uh, and, we, would gonna get that, and we would certainly get through that. But one of the things that struck me on Monday night was you can't create it when just at those moments when you need it. You've mm -hmm. got to have it you have to be inoculated so by the time you, you, you have issues like this, you have a board that is so finely functioning that you can get through anything. And then I was, I was using all that to think about some of the other boards that I've been on earlier in, uh, in my uh, uh, career uh, where you didn't have that, that kind of dynamic, where there were factions, where there was tension. Um, and Rob, I think part of this is sort of the contrast. I think it was a, a question of a period of time, too, where there wasn't transparency. I sat on a board 15 years ago where everybody, every person in the company who ever presented to the board had to submit his script to the CEO, not to any well, to the, the CEO. And if he went off script for one minute, his hand was slapped after the... And so you could imagine sort of what the, what the boardroom was like. It was like people reading uh, <laughs> scripts and the board just, it, it was no surprise that people were falling asleep. Yeah. I mean, it was just sort of, it was just, you know, monologues one after another. And I was thinking that that would be completely unacceptable today. You just, you wouldn't have it. it it's not that, that certain companies would try it and uh, it's just, you wouldn't have it. That the level of engagement, the kind of dialogue, the openness, because the other thing that struck me about the, um, uh, one of the other things that struck me about the event on Monday night was all the senior management was there and all the board knows all the senior management. Mm. It's, they don't show up once in a while for a presentation. We know them. And to go back to succession, and you need to know them. You know, the, the board needs to interact with the people who are the potential CEOs, who are running the divisions. Uh, and, and again, I think that is something that's happened in the last 10 years or so. This recognition that this is a really important part of the dynamic of a board uh, and uh, uh, something that, uh, uh, that is absolutely essential. So I, I think the engagement has changed, the level of engagement has changed, the, the um, breadth of the topics uh, that we cover I think in, in all the board meetings has changed. Um, 
and it's just it's more active uh, it's more involved it's more transparent and and it's just better uh, and then we can also get to the conversation because the other thing just to a future topic that I was thinking sitting there because I really am of two minds on the issue of terms, mm. board terms, and, we'll talk about and that. Yeah. Is, <laughs> now, is who, why would you ever say goodbye to these three men? I mean, yeah. they are so remarkable that if you could get them for another 15 years, you really should. Yeah. So, so I we can come back yes. to that, but uh, that was very much top of mind uh, yeah. for me that night. Thank you. Great. Well, so many of you are involved in helping to recruit directors to your board in some way, shape, or form. And obviously, given the dynamics that both of you e expressed and explained and, and how they are increasingly complex today, how does that impact recruiting individual directors? And what are you looking for more of, less of, both in terms of skills and personality? So, you know, I think this has now become an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. It is not that you recognize that Shelley or Raj are chronologically reaching the age and you need Precisely. to replace them and start working. I would say every board I'm on, it's a very active process. Almost all of them now have, who are the board members now? And more important, what are the skills required in the future? For example, the, somebody who is digitally more smart, somebody who is more savvy about technology, or if certain trends are changing in our industry, who can bring a perspective that's unique? So I think this almost an active process led, and the other thing which has changed obviously is this process is no more a CEO process. It is process that led by nominating governance committee, and independent directors have most of the say in this process, and obviously in terms of chemistry with CEO and making sure that he or she knows the person is comfortable with it is a very important part of the equation. But to get to that process, and the third, a third thing I would say is using outside resources. I mean, now, Kim, you, you know better than anybody here, you know, just about every significant company today uses outside agency for two reasons. One is to get as broad an access to talent as you can get not just the network, you can always throw names from your network, but also to have an independent assessment of these people before they are really selected and go through the process. Just like you're recruiting a senior executive or a CEO. And I would say, you know, at least the two or three situations that I've been involved in in director recruitment, in each one of them, we got directors largely who were not part of our initial pool of suggestions. So, so I think all that basically says the more independent-minded, broader experience people you need, the process really needs to be an ongoing process. I think the interesting thing is, I believe the turnover of board members in Fortune 500 is like seven, eight percent a year. There are not that many jobs that open up, and that's another reason to think about how you proactively, and we can come and talk about the term limits or non-performing director or whatever it is, we have to figure out a way of creating some motion in a constructive manner as well. And I think there's probably some ways to go on that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with everything you say. I think one of the things that I've seen that's changed over uh, the last five years or so is we're, we're much more thoughtful and disciplined in the boards I sit on and what we're looking for. You know, knowing that it takes years yeah to find a really great director. You know, you have to sit back and say quite specifically, you know, I'm, I'm looking for somebody who represents the developing world, or I'm looking for someone who's really uh, uh, very tech savvy or, or whatever it is. And we actually have categories now of things we're always on the look at. Mm -hmm. I, I've, you know, we use outside and on all the boards I sit on outside uh, sources, but the other thing is to just keep pushing your fellow directors because the, the, once they, their eyes are open to being on the, the lookout for, um, for people who might make interesting new directors, uh, I find I, I chair uh, nominating and corporate governance on, on GE, and I, not a board meeting goes by that I, someone doesn't give me a name, wh which is great. And the other thing I've, I've learned to do is just sort of by accident is I sort of throw the names out there, at some of the names out there at the meetings, because invariably, 
three or four people yeah. come up to me afterwards and go, th th that's a terrific person, or don't touch that person. Uh, yeah. And I'd rather know sort of early oh, yeah. on uh, what yeah. we're dealing with, because, because culture, I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about yeah. this too, but, but the culture of a company and a board is really important. And just because someone is brilliant or really you know, uh, outstanding in a, in a particular area, some of them just are not going to fit culturally. And so there are a lot of screens you sort of have to, yeah. you have to think about. Um, I, w I would also um, uh, comment that I I've had instances on two different boards where we've gone over to, to the extreme in terms of CEO picking people, is in each one of these instances, the CEO came up to me afterwards sheepishly to, to tell me that in, in each of the instances, instances, that person was actually their friend, and was it okay? And I said, well, it didn't, he didn't come to the attention of the, of the nominating committee meeting because he's your friend. It's just, yeah. he's superb, so right, uh, right. Uh, in each instance. So I think we've gone over to the other side where it's like, I've never seen that person before, yeah, yeah. and we have no prior relationships. Right? Just, uh, pushing the limit the other ones. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. There is that sensitivity, yeah. it's true. Yeah. Um, and so it, taking that into consideration in terms of the fit the culture, how do you really assess those directors? How do you know that when you meet them? What sorts of things are you trying to find out about them? What's helpful? I, I, I ha the most important thing to me, have, I've gone full circle on this yeah. whole thing, is, is good judgment. Mm. I, I just think there is, if you have to pick one thing, if you have to assess one thing for a board member is good judgment. Because at the end of the day, that's really what mm -hmm. directors are, are asked to do. And I don't know any way of assessing that other than talking to the person once, twice, <coughs> three times, having other people talk to them, yeah. talking to people who've right. served on anything with them or who have worked with them. Uh, and uh, uh, it's the most elusive. It's, it it's the hardest yeah. thing to it's very find. Very difficult. And yet it is absolutely crucial. And where we've had, where I've seen poorly performing directors, it's because they don't have good judgment. Uh, and uh, across everything, you know, they're they're disruptive. They're uh, yeah. uh, you know they they are disrespectful of others. They're you right. know, and it's it all really comes back to to uh, just sort of a certain level of wisdom and, and good judgment. I mean, the only thing I'd add here is what is that judgment based on? Is the track record usually? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So you really have to have people who you feel have delivered in their primary mission in the organization they ran. And I think the judgment piece is, did they grow in that process yeah. or got narrower in their vision? But sometimes if you work with one organization a long time, you kind of just uh, think whatever we do is the best way to do in the world. And you've seen those, that happened with right, right, some directors right, that yes. whatever we, their company did was the best, best solution to everything. And you have to kind of avoid that. But I think judgment is, I would agree that, you know, judgment and the chemistry on the board are essential. But, you know, it's like when you hire somebody, a PhD from a great school, you know he or she has the right qualifications. It's about how they would perform on the job and how they will lead the people. It really comes down to the winners and losers in some ways. I wouldn't, you know, I think, uh, in my view, turnarounds are more difficult yeah. mm -hmm. than riding, riding the tailwind. Yeah. Yeah. So you really have to look at the overall performance of the person. And actually, very important thing you asked, Donna, is their ability to, to operate under different environments. Because no company today lives through tailwind behind them or always with headwinds. But but I think they do need change in directions, ability to connect the dot, see things before others see it. And I think though you really, and, and I think the best leaders are made when they are in adverse conditions, not when the tailwind is behind them. So I would never hold anything against the ones who have been in a difficult situation, as long as they were able to navigate and did better than most people would have done. Yeah, I, I, no, I would agree. I'd yeah. say it's, it's how they handle how the they situation. Handle it, exactly. It's not because because yeah. we've all been in one of those situations, <laughs> yeah. you know, at, at, at some point. It's but uh, but I actually think you do learn a lot from the way they handled uh, that situation. And uh, uh, I've I've had a different uh, problem from uh, from time to time, and that is 
we've had some uh, people on the outside where we've had an excellent director who's had some trouble in his or her business is all of a sudden, you know, somebody pops up and says, I don't know why she's still on your board. And you say, well, I don't know why you don't, I mean, what do you, what do you have in mind is sort of, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, and my feeling always is, is she was an excellent director before. She's an excellent director today. She had a business problem that she solved, but this doesn't disqualify her now uh, as being a member on the board. But, mm -hmm. but I think there are some people who do pop up when that happens and say, I don't know why this person is still serving on your board. Uh, actually, they never, they never ding them because they're not experienced in efforts. The, the, the things that I hear um, when people come up to me afterwards have to do with uh, areas of judgment, um, not, not a good listener on the board, um, uh, div you know, views that are way off to the side. They never actually comment on uh, things, like more objective things. But uh, to the other side, actually, I find the in it's the individual who can help with people who are not that well known. And so my experience has been actually quite the opposite, that someone will stand up and say, well, that's a person who a lot of you might not know, but I served on the library board with him, and he was absolutely outstanding. He doesn't have a lot of corporate board experience, but I've seen him in a situation you know, where, where we've had to uh, come together as a group and drive to a point, and it's the individual endorsement of people who are not the marquee names and all that, that actually makes the board comfortable and says, well, if you, know, if you two people think, despite the, the fact that I've never heard of this person before, I, I give it a try. So I actually think personal endorsement uh, of individuals is the thing uh, that, uh, that drives it over the line, but you do have to drive it. I mean, that's, that's the thing. It's easy to say, uh, we'll take Jack Brennan, you know, as a director, mm -hmm. just, uh, but, but, to put, but to put someone up there who you find interesting, would really add diversity, cognitive diversity, beyond diversity diversity, uh, to the board, it's, you, you, you really have to make the case and, and I think push, but, but I have not, I've not found that to be, to be a problem if someone's willing to get up and passionately recommend somebody. Well, yeah, I, I, would, I agree with Shelley's comments. Here, here a couple of thoughts. I think one of the things that's happened because of involvement of recruiting firms in the process, almost universally, every company says, be sure to produce a list of diverse mm -hmm. candidates. Mm -hmm. It's almost a prerequisite. And you're right, if you're looking only for a sitting CEO or a sitting CFO, the population is relatively small and they're all in big demand. So I think one of the things has to be that you are willing to go down another notch. You are willing to open up a little bit the opportunity set. But I think what boards, I believe, still need to be cognizant of is about the value add of the board member rather than just diversity for diversity's sake. You know, I, th I think that's, that I still strongly believe because at the end of the day, if you just have diversity for sake of diversity, you really are doing injustice to the individual and to the company and the board. I would say it's important that you, as you select these diverse board members that you really spend more time on their onboarding process. Uh, because I, I think they are, they are different, they look different, they think maybe differently, that's the reason they're there, and they speak differently. And I think if you expect everybody sitting there to have the same way of dressing up and, and talking, I think you are really missing the opportunity and benefit of, uh, but, but I of think the worst member. That, that, that's true even in a, in a broader sense. In a broader you know, sense. As you were saying, we have on yeah. the Merck board, we have this brilliant man who is a, uh, he's, he's won a Nobel Prize. It's like, mm -hmm. my goodness, he won a Nobel Prize. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he's sitting next to me. Uh, but but in the onboarding process was important because he himself didn't feel that he could he, serve on yes, a corporate board, exactly. you know, despite yeah. the fact that we're a pharmaceutical company that needs to understand RNA and DNA, which he won his Nobel Prize in. Um, <laughs> and uh, and, and it, it's taken a little while, you know, to, to because mm -hmm. it's just not necessarily the environment that, 
that he's used to being. So I think onboarding and as a continuous process exactly. for a while is really critical uh, when you are taking anybody. Anybody, but you know, if you're a divorce uh, candidate, I have yeah. not served before or comes from a different background, that just uh, is important. But I think uh, more candidates are surfacing and especially with the tech world we're living in, you know, I think a lot of them are really very diverse crowd, whether it's in science, engineering, or information technology. So I think you'll find over time that uh, there will be very viable, diverse slate of candidates for board members. But you, you do have, have to keep asking. You have to keep asking, absolutely. Well, I mean, Mark and Reese joined uh, HP board at age 35. I mean, so it's, he was probably brought the average is down by about five, six years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but now it is, now he's turned forty. He turned forty last year. He says, "I'm your generation. I'm not the, <laughs> not the not the twenty year old starting." So you know, I, I think that's uh, you talk about diversity. Uh, again, you have to think about is uh, how you can bring them on, and how they can be contributing members, and even if they're interested. You know, it, it, it's, it's a, but, but I would say, especially in the digital space, there is a, both a desire on part of old companies, new companies, to have somebody who really understands how technology can be used in the future. Not for their internal systems, but more in terms of outreach to the customers and building their markets. And that is, people who have that experience are rare, but they think differently, and I think having them as part of your group is a good thing. The other thing you know, we have tried to do in a couple of boards is to have a tech committee where some board members are the tech committee and then you invite some of these real entrepreneurs, up and comers as part of that. And over time they get become comfortable and you know, one, one or two of them can step on the board positions. I, I don't think you have to trade off fresh blood for collegiality. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, you know, sometimes when investors talk, it's like it's sort of, you know, everyone goes and plays golf together and we're all drinking tea and it's all really nice. And, you know, it's, it, I, think, I think the reality is that there are, there are divergent views. The, the reason people feel comfortable, I, I would argue, presenting these divergent views is because there's an, there's an atmosphere and an environment in the room that says it's okay. That because there's inherent respect, it's, it, it is encouraged and applauded when people debate issues. And, and I, I don't serve on a board where it, there's not active debate every hour. Uh, and there's, there's not agreement. There is not agreement necessarily on, uh, on lots of points. But, but I think the, the issue is that there's respect, so people hear each other out. Uh, and there is an inherent um, sort of uh, acceptance that if all, if enough people on the board want to go in one direction, that the others, even though they might go in another, will actually go with the will of the of the group. Because I think at the end of the day, you really do need to, uh, I, I, you know, being a dissident. Uh, when you're on a board, it only, uh, I think, is, is productive for a while. Um, or, you, or you get off the board. I mean, if you, but, but I, I just, I do think people misinterpret the whole collegiality, mm -hmm. cordiality with a, a, a um, level of discourse in the boardroom that's not really rigorous and, and really demanding um, of, of debating different outcomes. You know, I would almost substitute the word being civil mm. <laughs> to each other. And the other thing is, you know, not personalizing. You know, I think when it gets right. out of control is if I say to her, you know, you are full of this and that. It, it, as long as it stays on the issue at hand, it is very constructive and in fact almost essential today. I have, I sit on every board where issues surface. i give you a, one example I can give you. When Ed Breen came to the board about seven years ago that he said, this conglomerate doesn't make any sense business-wise. 
and we should break this company up because otherwise we are doing injustice to all three or four businesses. And board was shocked. They thought we were there to build a new GE. And, but he worked with us for six or nine months to really say why this made sense, both strategically, operationally, for the people and performance of the company. And, and, and he worked with us. It, and board was halfway, half thinking that this is the crazy thing to do, difficult, expensive, and uh, distracting. The other one saying is we should do it. And I, I think the outcome was excellent. The stock price gone from $10 to $80 in the last 10 years because he created five companies that needed to be separate. But, but I think it, it took a lot of debate and a lot of thinking and a lot of risk taking to do that. I, I don't think on any major issue that I know, of, whether it's an acquisition or a major project, a major capital spend, a major directional change for the company, where to start with the management view is the only view right. and the board rubber stamps. It just doesn't happen. One more comment around activists and listening to shareholders. I would say in today's world, ignoring those forces is its own peril for both the management on the Agreed. board. I mean, this, if you think about successful, lar large companies really facing this, whether it's Microsoft or it's P&G or it's Apple, Nobody is spared. In, in the chemical industry, which had never heard of activists, they're all in there now, for the air products and the pond and you know, all over the place. So here is my view. I think, first of all, you know, you can own half a percent of a company and make a lot of noise, and they are master at using the media. But I think it's very important for the board and the management not to totally ignore, because they're smart people. Absolutely. They have a point of view. They have done their work, not necessarily with all the facts at hand, and we faced that at Hewlett Packard when Relational came in. And our, our judgment, I was chair of the nominating governance committee, and we said, we heard you, and we'll consider Ralph Whitworth if he is going to be a good director at Hewlett Packard, period. If he's not, we are going to tell them, thank you for your advice, and we'll move on. And as you know, I mean, all, uh, earlier this year, we appointed him as an interim chairman because he was the most objective mm -hmm. and a qualified mm -hmm. board member. So, so I think there is not one solution, but ignoring the shareholders, both institutional and activists today, is something that no board or no company can, 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 can get away with. I, I was at a, uh, a session yesterday down at the New York Stock Exchange, and somebody, uh, who's a, it was a group of lead directors, and somebody said, no, on our board, we don't let the lead director speak to shareholders. And I said, excuse me, I don't understand that. What, what do you mean you don't allow yeah. the lead? <laughs> no, this, only the CEO speaks for this company. And I said, well, that's just an absurdity. In, in the year 2013, yeah. I, I don't know on what grounds you can defend the, sorry, he doesn't talk to people. Uh, yeah. you know, sort of position. And so, I mean, it's just, you, you've got to, you, you have to have the gut the dialogue, right? Yeah. Uh, you, you know, the, it was, it was, the one interesting statistics I give you, which, which probably, we all talk about activists and hedge funds and mar is shareholders who are just trading. If you look at the top 500 company, maybe even 1,000, just about every one of them has all the index funds owning about 30, 25 to 30 yeah. percent of each yeah. company. Vanguard owns six, seven percent of every company. Mm -hmm. And if you take the employees for the 401k and you take your top four or five shareholders, Dodge and Cox, Wellington, big names, you have 70 percent of major U.S. corporations owned by institutions who are long-term shareholders. And by the way, they are speaking up. Historically, they kept quiet, allowing, giving benefit of the, to the management, but they are speaking up in issues like strategy, issues about compensation, and they would vote against the management recommendations. So activists are not just limited to hedge funds and activists. I think everybody feels an obligation to the owners of the company who are real investors. I don't know if you've seen this, Shelley, but no, I think no, that, no, that's what sure. I see. No, definitely, yeah. Yeah. definitely. And what does that mean in terms of skills, though? Because yeah. not everyone would necessarily be qualified to speak with the institutional yeah. investor community. And does that impact uh, what you're looking for as you, uh, as you plus out your board? 
So, you know, I've been involved with two companies where we generally, I mean, it has happened in the context of say on pay. Yeah. This whole thing about allowing board members to speak and be accessible to the shareholders has been around say on pay issue. And uh, it has generally been the head of the comm committee or the lead independent director who have been the spokespeople. I think the management resistance to having board speak, they feel they are not fully informed or they will run foul of Reg FD. The reality is they're pretty <coughs> smart people. Mm -hmm. And investors don't ask you questions on that way in any way, okay? And my view is we ought to find a way of becoming more proactive about this over I time agree. because, you know, these investors are big investors who have put billions and billions of dollars in the stock of your company, and they're here for the long term. They know your competition, they know your strategy, they know your management team versus others. I think you would be foolish not getting some perspective from them. It's just gonna help you get better. Yes. So how you do it is important. It has to be managed well, but, but I, I think it's not free for all 12 board members to speak uh, to the shareholders, but I think if it's managed well, this could be a very important listening point for corporations. Right. Yeah. Anything further, Shelley? Yeah. What, what about just broadly? We're you know a bit free flowing here, but but on the topic of activism, which, you, which you've brought up, and as you say, there are different types of activists, but there are some that are that are more um, aggressive than others. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is that the nice way of putting Nicely it? Nicely said. Yeah. <laughs> 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 And for those that are more aggressive, they are sometimes coming after the board first as an excuse and, and poking holes in the quality of the board, their skills, suitability for that company. Do they, do they have, you know, does the board have knowledge of the industry, age, tenure, you know, those sorts of things. And how are, are boards, as you see boards evolve, how are boards prepared for those sorts of discussions and, and maybe in some ways protecting themselves for those sorts of discussions or against those <coughs> sorts of discussions? Well, I think the questions, though, are legitimate. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's yeah. sort of, are, are they qualified? Yeah. Are they, um, uh, it, but, but you have to make sure that it's, it's the, you know, that the answers are prepared and, and that the questions are legitimate. I mean, it's just, uh, uh, I got into a tussle with, with, uh, um, a conversation uh, with somebody about uh, um, somebody's qualifications and I, they, they seem stellar to me and the person on the other side said, oh, no, 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 but, but he's part of old banking, not new banking. Oh. You know, so it's just, it's almost you can't be right. Yeah. When, when they want to pick a fight, yeah. they're just going to pick a fight. And so, I, I, I mean, one of the places I've gotten to is you know, you, you have to have the conversation and you have to know yourself that, mm -hmm. that your board is qualified and, and what the, the sort of the organizing principle is that, uh, mm -hmm. that, that brings, that puts them together and makes them a strong board. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but I think trying to answer each one of, each one of those questions right. specifically, that they don't want to have a good answer. They want to say, but she's not qualified. She doesn't know about risk. Right. No. So. I think it's, you have to stand your ground. I mean, if you believe in what you're doing and how you have staffed your board and how they're working, I think to yield to a pressure from anybody is a wrong move on part of the board. So you just have to be sure. And you know, as you say, they're looking for a dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're not so really, nice they're opening a door, they're opening a door, but yeah. you know, they're not expecting you to just follow through either. I was just telling somebody uh, at the start, I, I was, you know, at this, at this thing at the stock exchange yesterday that I was at, uh, somebody, some lead director very proudly said, I wasn't even sure which company uh, he was from, said that they have a system where they have 10 board members, they rate each other every year, and whoever gets the lowest score is voted off the island, basically. <laughs> and I thought, who would want to be on that board? I mean, you know, just imagine the atmosphere in the boardroom every time you want to ask a question about, you know, does that now, did, did I just now get a ding for yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, But uh, so, so to me, that's one end of a poll uh, in, in terms of, uh, 
uh, of evaluations. I mean, the, the issue is uh, that in theory, that's all great. In theory, you should have term limits. In theory, you should have new blood. And, but the reality is when you get r a really superb director uh, who understands the company, whose judgment everyone respects, um, who has a history and, and, and understands sort of where the company has come from, to actually just say, okay, time's up, you're 10 years. It's, it's just a tragedy, I mean, to me. And uh, uh, so I, I'm sort of at a point where I'd like to be able to have the means to, to um, uh, not continue on with a director who's, who's not doing so well, but at the same time to also have the flexibility to keep on just stellar people who, who are respected uh, uh, by everyone and who make all the difference to the board. So I, I don't know where I am, and then if you're in the UK, you have to, so, I, you know. So, so you know, I, I think I'm somewhere there as well because I think chronologically it means nothing. I've seen people switch off at age 55, and then I have Jack Kroll who's 76 this year. Mm -hmm. Every board he's on, they keep re, you know, giving him an exception because he's so exceptional. And, and we have to find a middle ground about saying is, uh, and we need the hardest thing, I would say, despite everything, the hardest thing on the board is to ask one of your peers or colleagues to step down. But if you use annual assessment process in a you know proper way and not voting <laughs> but but in a proper way I think it's it, it, there is a dignified way to go to an individual and they know it it's like you know I mean I've the hardest thing for me was to fire anybody but I tell you what every time I did it the person was relieved and the company was better off for it and it's pretty much the same thing at board level these are these are respectable accomplished people they do not want to embarrass themselves or the company or the board. If the lead director or the chairman of the board, after you know, thoughtful discussion with other board members and the person goes there, I would say 99 out of 100 folks will say, thank you very much. I appreciate I, was, I had good fun being on this board and I understand it's time to move on. And it can happen at the time of you don't want to fire a board in the middle of the session, but when you have the proxy, their name doesn't appear. I, I think there are ways to accommodate this. In fact, I think if I go back uh, at Roman Haas, we had 68, then we raised it to 70, then we raised to 72. We kept doing it for Roger Penske. Well, so how old's Roger yeah. now? Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> and as part of it is how many qual good directors you can get, and people are, you know, have more uh, duration in terms of staying connected and being productive. So. So I think we have to find some middle ground here about what's sensible uh, rather than just mandate things. I, I also think going back the other way, yeah. it's uh, directors themselves, the individuals. Yeah. I, I think we have to make it easier for them to say, you know, actually 12 years is enough. Yeah. No, just because they sort of feel loyalty, they feel they should, everybody does till, uh, mm. uh, till retirement age. And, and I just, uh, I, I think making it easier to say, I, I've done this too many times, and I, I'd like to just step aside and let someone else, I, I think would be a, a, a good thing to think about how to, how to do the, that. How to, how to create that environment, environment that right, people right. don't feel like they were kicked out. out. Exactly, <laughs> But exactly. it was something that they decided exactly. voluntarily, right. yeah. 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 I, I'd say to the second one on the boards I sit on, we, yes, we, we know who we'd like to put on the board next, more or less, and, do, and we've had conversations with some of them, mm -hmm. so just, to, just to gauge interest, just to sort of see where we are. So, uh, uh, so we're, we're prepared um, that way. Um, I think on the objective outside observer, I, I've done um, evaluations always. I feel. I feel like I've, I've tried everything. Um, I think the most important thing is not so much that they're outside or inside as that they're excellent listeners and can then synthesize and interpret what they've heard. And in some instances, that's an outsider. In some instances, it's an insider. 
Uh, but I, I think pulling out of the board members themselves uh, their thoughts. Um, the one really bad experience that I've had was an outsider who spent an hour on the phone with each one of the board members, then came back to the board and spent 20 minutes reporting out what the board members had said and 40 minutes going through slides of what this man believed made an effective board, which was I felt like saying, I, did anyone ask you? I, you know, it was just, uh, uh, thank you, itself. thank <laughs> you, pro exactly, for <laughs> promoting the next engagement. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, so I just, but, but, I, but I think those skills of listening and synthesizing and knowing the company well enough, to, well enough that they can interpret for you uh, where people are saying similar things, even though they might be coming at it in, in uh, slightly different ways. Um, I, here's something that I learned having gone through the last time, which is a great question to know what's on the board's mind, which I hadn't tried before, is um, what would you like to know more about and what items would you like to see on the agenda for next year, which, which I thought was just, you know, that's just a nice thing to do to kind of see if there's any. We learn more from the answers to that questions about, about areas that people either didn't feel they knew enough about, uh, that were critical to the future of the company in their view. I mean, you know, you can, that, that's a bit of an interpretation, yeah. but, but that, that's a question that I, I wouldn't have thought of necessarily as being essential, but, but turns out that it really unleashed a whole flow of uh, uh, information that we, that we didn't have before and, and sent us all off, you know, in, in some new places that we didn't know were yeah. things that were on people's minds that they felt were important. So you, I, I think, you know, you can alternate. I've been on board. So, so occasionally they'll use the lead director or the chairman to do this. Other times they'll have somebody from outside just to kind of mix and match. But the one you mentioned, Shelley, which I found very useful is something which Jack instituted at both Tyco and Delphi. And that was doing exactly the question that you asked. So what are the most important things that board should focus on in the next year. And he does that as part of the evaluation. And then he goes one step beyond that. He would then have three board objectives for the following year mm -hmm. with clear metrics mm -hmm. in front of it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it helps a lot because it focuses your meetings and discussions on what we believe are the critical things for the company. It can be CEO succession, it could be divest, divesting or rearranging the portfolio, it could be your strategy in China, not a dozen things, but just three or four things which are outside of just delivering your number for the coming year. And that really opens up more accountability for the board and at the end of the year he would ask each one of us and the management. That's the other thing, is asking the management to really say, is your board really helpful for you to run your business? And I think that's an important yeah, no. question to ask because we are there to help the management on behalf of the shareholders. We are not there to just exist in our own right. And I think both those questions really led to some interesting outcomes and priorities. You both indicated that succession planning is really important, that there's a lot more thought around that and that it's not just replacing ex-director knowing that they will retire next year, but thinking thoughtfully about the future three to five years out, teeing up potential directors for the course of that time. What are the sorts of skills that you find your boards are focusing on more? And I think we've heard a little bit about that today. Certainly digital is probably one of them. International hasn't come up, but I would say that that's probably Definitely. another um, important skill. So how are, how are boards thinking about that these days? And how are they bringing those skills on board, given they're both you know, digital might mean that you go to the 35-year-old or something, you know, that those skills tend to be younger. International has its own complexities. How are boards thinking about those skills today? I'd go back to, you know, a little bit of this metrics of mm. saying is, okay, here is where the company's strategic plan is. Here are the skill sets that we need to have and who is chronologically likely to move on and what skills we want to bring on. I mean, cyber, I would add cybersecurity, not because yes. this book is out, but I tell you, this is a real 
threat. Sure. Yeah. And uh, a threat on two fronts. One is losing your prized information, uh, and, and, but also your customers. And then more important, this ending up in the wrong hands. And I just heard the head of NSA yesterday morning, and it's scary what they believe mm -hmm. is what, our, what China, China, with the support of the government, have information about every single U.S. company and every single important technology. That's scary. But I'm saying, you know, th so there are areas like that. Risk, risk is another area. You know, it's risk is, is a big <laughs> deal. And you, know, you, and you think about risk, macro risks, which we all can sort of pontificate, but there are industry risk, and then you have internal risks. So there are some what I call bottoms-up risks, which you cannot ignore. Then you have some specific things because maybe significant change in the direction of the industry. And the third one is some macro risk about where you should be doing business and why and why not. And all, all of that. So I think risk area is another word. I, I'm not sure there are experts in this area by any means. Mm -hmm. So you have to go back to the f judgment. <laughs> people who dealt with those situations and were able to figure some of these things out. Yeah. You know, just we started two new uh, committees at GE this year, risk and science and technology. Yeah. And that's probably, yeah. That's yeah. And, and the other the other thing that I think we talk about more and more is uh, people comfortable dealing with regulators, yes. yeah. which, which, is a, which is a worldwide yeah. sort of phenomenon. And it is a skill, it, it's a skill a, and uh, uh, and a, 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 a set of insights and perceptions that uh, uh, that you need a little bit of experience, I think, to uh, to get into that that mindset and that rhythm of, of uh, regulators. The government relations become important. Exactly. Brussels and Beijing and Washington and many other places. Yeah. You're absolutely and and right. I will say the other one, which is a little sort of softer, is there seems to be an increasing recognition that marketing is important. We've got all these finance guys and lawyers and bankers and all that, but at the end of the day, you know, to uh, as we go to new markets and the ability to to understand how to how to market to to different audiences, I think is is becoming at least people are talking yes. about it more. Yeah. That's true. Well, on the international front, um, there are different ways of addressing that, and a lot of directors do have broad international experience, both of you do with the companies that you ran and, and your board experience. But there's also an increasing perspective. We're certainly seeing this at Egon Zender, where a lot of clients are saying, we actually want someone who has on-the-ground experience in that particular country, and maybe even preferably on-the-ground experience today. So what are the pros and cons of international directors and how are, are, do you think boards are increasingly internationalizing the boards and addressing that? I, I, I want to start with a statement that I don't, I believe that telepresence and conference calls are disruptive to the function of yes. the board. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, face to have, face. Yeah. Uh, so, so whoever you pick yeah. has to be physically yeah. present. Yeah. And uh, that is the biggest issue of it all. Is. Especially it, from Asia. Yes, yeah. exactly. You know, because and that's you know, Euro, Europe, yeah, yeah. Europe you can manage. Sort of. Uh, yeah, but sort of. Right. You know, but they have right. to be willing to spend the time. Right. I think the right. time is an issue, especially for an active yeah. executive. Yeah. Yes, it's, a, it's an issue. But I mean, uh, it's, uh, um, you know, we, um, uh, we, we have somebody on the Merck board who's, uh, uh, who's based in Switzerland, but his area of responsibility is, is Latin America. And so we sort of get him on the... You know, as he's flying back, he flies through us. Uh, and, uh, and, and on uh, GE, we, um, uh, we talked to three different people from Asia. Uh, GE's got eight board meetings a year in New York. And everyone was interested until they couldn't even come to have a meeting yeah. to say hello. And then you said, are you really sure you can do this eight times a year? And the answer was no. Yeah. And so, but, but there are ways around it. I mean, we have a fabulous new board member on, on uh, GE, uh, Frank D'Souza, who's yeah. the CEO of Cognizant. 99% mm -hmm. of his employees and his business is done in India, but he lives in New Jersey. So, you know, there are just, there are ways that you can, that you can kind yeah. of, uh, 
uh, work around it. And on Blackstone, we have Brian Mulroney. Yeah, yes. And he could easily come down yes. from Canada. So uh, that's, right. uh, that's our international yeah. component. <laughs> One, you know, there, there is other, other, the two things I've noticed is if you want a European executive or agent, Number one, you want somebody who's CEO level because they have more control of their calendar. And if they have reasons to come to U.S. frequently and yes. they can organize themselves, it's a much better way for them to participate. Uh, because, you know, we had Ronaldo Schmidt from Dutch Bank and previously from BASF, and he made every single meeting 14 years he was on the board because he was head of North America for Dutch Bank and he had reasons and he could organize himself. But if you get division heads or CFO of foreign companies whose calendar is beyond their control, it's hard for them to do that. But I think, the, but, but you're right, Shell, you have to kind of pick and choose. And then, you know, there are a lot of Americans who have worked extensively around the world and have come back here. And don't discount them as a big source of uh, global experience. Right. And do you see boards addressing that um, potentially with advisory boards? Is that, and how do you feel about that versus the, the corporate board? Not very common, Bray, I've yeah. seen. I've yeah. seen board committees expand, like we have five or six committees that look back at technology obviously being one, uh, finance and investment outside of audit because they're big deals. But you know, I, I, I think advisory boards become kind of just, we come there once a year or twice a year, and you listen to them and then they go away, you do what you are you're doing. And, and I think it's you know? more, it, the, the advisory yeah. boards function better, I think, as yeah. advisors to the company yeah. rather than as advisors to the board. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, on, 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 on rather particular and narrow so, subjects. Yeah. Yeah. You started off talking about um, how important it is, you know, how there's, there's such an increasing um, uh, time commitment on behalf of the board directors that there's that you know this is a vi this is not for the faint of heart. So all I must admit the, the number of times I have uh, it, you know potential you know first time directors say oh, we're dying to sit on a board and I want to do this and and you know and we always have to warn them exactly what is involved. But with all of that said, what is your perspective on and in your observations on sitting versus? Uh, retired executives and the balance between the two. You also spoke of three amazing directors okay. at, at GE okay. and their contributions. So what are your thoughts on, on that balance? It, it, de it depends on the person. I, there are some retired uh, CEOs who are the best directors that I could I even imagine. Uh, and there are some, you know, and, and there are sitting CEOs who are great and you know, it's just I don't I don't think you can answer that uh, as a as categories. Yeah. I think it depends on the individuals, and uh, m most of the CEOs understand what's involved in sitting on a board. So once they say yes, chances are they've kind of committed to that. And and most CEOs, sitting CEOs I know, I mean they don't they don't sit on more than one board usually. And that has changed. Yes used to be two, even three, That's but right. because of the time commitment, it's mm -hmm. almost all company that I know of. First of all, they require permission from the board. Mm -hmm. And the second one is uh, they really don't sit on one board and sometimes they sit on none. Yeah. So, so I think that's, that's uh, because just the jobs are too demanding. Uh -huh. I, I would say I would avoid it like and a plague. Too. Plague, because I think there's no question because of so much compliance work and regulatory work the boards have to do, whether it's FCPA or accounting or whatever, and compensation. That work clearly belongs on the committee. There's no way a board in its entirety can handle it. And I think that's run in the right place. But the idea that each board member can reach out to management ranks and have a side conversation. I really think board is a body you can always have, you know, when we would travel together four East Coast board members going to West Coast and going to Europe sometimes, we have a lot of time together. So yes, we talk about issues, but at least it's not about, uh, it's about issues again. It's not about gossip. It's not about anything. It's about substantive issues. Clearly, if you're head of audit committee, you have a lot of interaction with the CFO and the controller outside the meetings. If you're chair of the comm committee, you have a lot of interaction with your uh, head of human resources. But if you're talking about, I rarely see board members calling each other 
between meetings or between calls to, to check on things. I, I, I think a, a strong lead director yeah, can, that can, play a, pl yeah, can play that, an important that role really, here. Yeah. Because I think if you do have an issue or a question or something, yeah. rather than just kind of calling your, the person you like to talk to on the board, lead director, I mean, to have a, a lead director who's responsive, who you can call and just, you know, a ask the question, put the issue forth, and then usually he'll figure out whether he brings it, you know, it's brought to a committee or to the, or to the board or, uh, but at least there's, there's sort of a central point that you can, that you can go to and just, get, and he sort of holds, if four people are calling him with the same question, you know, he's got a question, right, that, that uh, has to be dealt with. So, so, but I, but I think the good lead directors uh, make it known that they are happy to, to deal with any issues uh, in between the meetings. Uh, you know, we are probably one of the very few companies, probably the four or five in the Fortune 500 who have cumulative voting and, uh, and majority voting rule, and we are stuck with it. If I were to start over again, you would never want to have that. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's there, you know, again, it's one of those things. If, uh, if the shareholders decide they want to accumulate vote against one or two directors and vote that way, just like the activists, you better listen to what their point of view is. But, you know, th nobody can, if, if they get a majority vote, there's no, you know, they, even if they, they, as long as they're elected, and uh, it's, it's hard to display, ask, ask a board member to step down based on, uh, you know, like somebody getting 50% or 51% of the vote. So I, I would say, you know, again, it's one of those things, if you don't have it, don't put it in. <laughs> and, uh, and if you have it, if, and if you really are in that situation, you really listen to what their argument is, and I will tell you this: you know, when the when the board members get anything less than 75, 80 percent vote, they know shareholders have spoken, and they need to reflect what it's tell, what, what they're telling you. You know, that that that's really the way to think about this. I do I do know a few yeah. individuals who've who've had some, you know, come close. They yeah. they didn't get 50, but but they've come close and. Uh, in the uh, few instances I'm thinking of, uh, they've actually stepped down okay. because they, they just they, they just don't. Who needs it? You know, it's kind of they they become a distraction for the whole company and the board, and and it's. Uh, uh, but but then you know you have a good board member. Now that then that makes you weep even harder because you know you have somebody who really is doing the right thing for the company and for the board. And we had two people step down this year. You know, John Hammergren was CEO of McKesson, and then uh, Ken Ken, uh, who was uh, head of uh, Wachovia. Great board members. Mm -hmm. but, you know, they decided. You know, their reputation. They think you know they don't want to be a distraction. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. <laughs> it's a very complex environment. Thank you. Thank you.